on World News Tonight. New reigns. The UK sits tight as an extremely tight fight for the nation's premiership reaches its end. Historic floods. Pakistan struggles as never before face floods grapple the most of the country. Coalition chaos. Prague erupts in protests as political turmoil elevates. Trash to treasure. A unique and eye-catching way to raise pollution awareness. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. And we begin tonight's broadcast with breaking news. Following a fiery race to the finish line, Britain's election for its newest Prime Minister has concluded and the results of the vote are now locked in. The final vote count puts Conservative Party representative Liz Truss ahead of her opponent Rishi Sunak by considerable margin. The outcome of the election, which was open to some 200,000 party members from August 1st to September 2nd, left little room for suspense, seeing as Ms. Truss was so ahead in the polls against her rival, former Finance Minister Rishi Sunak. According to surveys published on July 21st, 62% of the survey Tory members preferred her. Only 38% said that they would choose Mr. Sunak, which is in a 24-point gap. Ms. Truss becomes the third woman to lead the British government after Margaret Thatcher and Theresa May. Ms. Truss has been an MP for Norfolk since 2010 and has held various ministerial positions under three-time Prime Minister since 2012. In her youth, she was a Liberal Democrat activist before joining the Conservatives. Meanwhile, Pakistan continues to fall to ruins as extensive flooding has caused sickness to run rampant across the nation, further complicating the distribution of essential items and other supplies, creating a major shortage which handicaps thousands. A wedding hall in the Pakistani town of Johi once received hundreds of joyful revelers. Now it is receiving hundreds of sick patients suffering from the effects of flooding that has inundated Pakistan, leaving the country battling with a relief and rescue operation of near unprecedented scale. Johi in the hardest hit Sindh province remains cut off from road access. Roshan Ali Khan is a doctor at the makeshift clinic, which provides treatment free of charge. He says it is treating up to 800 patients a day. Record monsoon rains and melting glaciers in the northern mountains brought floods that have killed over 1,200 people. And the death toll continues to climb. On Saturday, 57 more deaths were reported, including 25 children. The floods, which have been blamed on climate change, inundated a third of the South Asian country. Residents say their biggest concern is now the lack of food. This man says all the crops in the area have been destroyed. Many areas are still cut off by flood water. In Balochistan, Pakistan's army is delivering aid by helicopter. The province has seen widespread devastation, including the washing away of key rail and road networks, as well as breakdowns in telecommunications and power infrastructure. Initial estimates of the damage across the country have been put at $10 billion. Aid has flown in from a number of countries, but charities in Pakistan have warned that there are still millions who have not been reached by aid and relief efforts. Ukraine is attempting to turn the tides on the ongoing conflict, according to President Vladimir Zelensky, who announced that the country was successful in taking back some of the captured territories from the enemy forces. President Volodymyr Zelensky said Sunday that his forces had taken two settlements in southern Ukraine, a third settlement in the east and additional territory in the east of the country. He did not say precisely where the territories were and provided no timeline, except to say that he had received good reports at a meeting Sunday from his military commanders and head of intelligence. Ukraine began a counteroffensive last week targeting the south, which was seized by the Russians early in the conflict. In his nightly video address, Zelensky also warned Europe that maintaining gas ties with Russia could lead to disaster saying energy dependence on Russia is used against Europe in Moscow. 
Moscow last week said it would keep the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, its main gas channel to Germany, closed. And G7 countries announced a planned price cap on Russian oil exports. The Kremlin said it would stop selling oil to any countries that implemented the cap. Moscow blamed Western sanctions and technical issues for the energy disruptions. European countries who have backed Kyiv with diplomatic and military support have accused Russia of weaponizing energy supplies. Also on Sunday, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow said Trump appointee John Sullivan has left Russia after finishing his tenure as U.S. ambassador there. A U.S. State Department official said Sullivan had served a typical tour length for U.S. ambassadors to Russia. The Czech Republic has been set ablaze with protests and revolt as thousands unite to oust the current coalition government for its mishandling of the soaring energy prices, amongst other crises, and the riddle of the nation. Other than a world news special correspondent, Chetan Dharmaratna is watching the events unfold from Normandy in France. Yes, Shanali. An estimated 70,000 people protested in the Prague against the Czech government, calling on the ruling coalition to do more to control soaring energy prices and voicing opposition to the European Union and NATO. Organizers of the demonstration from several far-right and fringe political groups, including the Communist Party, said the central European nation should do neutral military and ensure direct contracts with the gas suppliers, including Russia. Police estimates put the number of the protesters at over 70,000. The protest at Wenzelis Square in the city centre was held a day after the government survived a non-confidence war amid opposition claims of inaction against the inflation and energy prices. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adi Darna World News Special Correspondent Chetan and Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. Moving on to the United States, the country sees no end to the destruction caused by Mother Nature as the nation's weather melodies now include massive dust storms along with blazing wildfires and floods which leave thousands helpless. Tonight, torrential rain sparking flash floods across North Georgia. Roads washed out with 12 inches of rain falling in some areas in a matter of hours. This backyard transformed into a lake. The governor declaring a state of emergency and residents of the city of Somerville told to boil water before drinking it after flooding at a nearby plant. 11 million across the region under flood alerts through Labor Day, as far as Indiana, where sheriffs discovered one dead. Meanwhile, in California, the small town of Weed is coming to terms with its losses. Dozens of homes destroyed with the historically black neighborhood of Lincoln Heights, the center of the devastation. A 100-year-old community erased by flames in just a few hours. I ran and turned on the water faucet, looked in the neighbor's backyard. It was completely on fire. A tragedy all too familiar for Robert and Barbara Thomas, whose home burned along with their granddaughters down the block. Just eight years after their relatives lost everything in a 2014 fire. Across the West, 46 million are under heat alerts, with many again facing potentially record-setting triple-digit temperatures. In California, the demand on the power grid is intensifying. Authorities have been warning residents for days about the potential for rolling blackouts. Those last few days are likely to be a dress rehearsal for what's going to be a much more significantly stressed set of conditions here. While in Arizona, this massive dust storm left thousands without power near Phoenix disrupting traffic and dimming Friday night lights. A holiday weekend of extremes that few will forget. In his first rally address since the controversial Mar-a-Lago surge, former U.S. President Donald Trump quipped back at the FBI and zeroed in on President Biden's primetime address, calling him an enemy of the state. Former President Trump firing back at the Justice Department in his first rally since the lawfully executed FBI search of his private club last month. The shameful raid and break-in of my home, Mar-a-Lago, was a travesty of justice. Revealing that the hunt for classified documents extended not only to his wife's personal items, but also his teenage son's bedroom. Leaving everything they touched in far different condition than it was when they started. Legal experts say that's well within the bounds of the government search warrant. The DOJ says the FBI retrieved hundreds of pages of highly sensitive material from the Florida estate. 
And on Saturday, the former president also repeatedly taking aim at his successor. The most vicious, hateful, and divisive speech ever delivered by an American president. The 45th president blasting the 46th for that primetime address last week in which President Biden cast some Trump Republicans as a threat to the country. MAGA forces are determined to take this country backwards. He's an enemy of the state. You want to know the truth. But with the midterms now two months away, the White House says President Biden has no plans to stop criticizing the former president and his supporters. He has taken many, plenty of times uh, to call out where we are with the extreme, that extreme part of the Republican Party, and he will continue to do that. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, the last leader of the Soviet Union was laid to rest. Thousands paid their respects to the Nobel Peace Prize winner despite not being allowed to say it. Funeral. Russian President Vladimir Putin was also absent for the procession, claiming he had paid respects prior. The last Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, was laid to rest on Saturday. Gorbachev, who presided over the Soviet Union from 1985 until its collapse in 1991, died on Tuesday, aged 91. Much like the funerals of previous Soviet leaders, Gorbachev's body lay in state in Moscow's Grand Hall of Columns. But unlike his predecessors, Gorbachev was denied a full state funeral. And Russian President Vladimir Putin was noticeably absent. He briefly paid his respects on Thursday at the hospital where Gorbachev died, but said his busy Kremlin schedule prevented him from attending Saturday's service. Putin's no-show is seen by some as a calculated snub by the former KGB officer, who has rolled back many of Gorbachev's reforms. Putin has called the breakup of the Soviet Union the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Also absent were many Western heads of state and government, who normally would have attended, kept away by the chasm in relations between Moscow and the West following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. One European leader who did attend was Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who was seen placing flowers by Gorbachev's coffin. Orban is one of the few European leaders to have good relations with Putin. Gorbachev's legacy still divides opinion inside and outside of Russia. Nevertheless, thousands of Russians of all ages lined up to pay their respects. Best known in the West for helping end the Cold War and reducing his country's nuclear stockpile, Gorbachev unwittingly presided over the Soviet Union's demise. His final resting place is in Moscow's Novodevichy Cemetery, where he will be buried alongside his wife, Raisa, who died 23 years ago. Over in Argentina, thousands are gathering in solidarity to show outrage against a failed assassination attempt on the country's vice president. While the attacker's motives are yet to be disclosed, it is suspected to be linked to the corruption charges she currently faced in court. Hundreds of thousands of people have taken to the streets of Argentina to protest an assassination attempt against the country's vice president. Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner escaped unharmed on Thursday after a man fired a loaded gun just inches from her head. The weapon failed to go off. The attack happened outside Fernandez de Kirchner's home in Buenos Aires, where hundreds of people had gathered to support her as she faces a corruption trial. Authorities have arrested a suspect a 35-year-old Brazilian man, but have yet to reveal a motive for the attack. On the streets of Buenos Aires on Friday, there was an outpouring of support for the leftist former president. Pope Francis and the United States have joined regional leaders in condemning the attack, which has happened at a time of deep economic crisis in Argentina. Argentina's president, who visited Fernandez de Kirchner on Friday, said it was the country's worst incident since it returned to democracy decades ago. Fernandez de Kirchner is a divisive figure who is currently facing potential corruption charges linked to an alleged scheme to divert public funds while president between 2007 and 2015. If found guilty, she could face up to 12 years in prison. She denies the allegations and her supporters 
have gathered daily outside her home, accusing the opposition and the judiciary of a witch hunt. On the other side of the globe, Indonesians are now struggling with transportation nationwide as its government has introduced a 30% price hike on fuel to handle ballooning subsidies. In a controversial move, Indonesia raised subsidized fuel prices by about 30% on Saturday. While the decision risks mass protests, it's an attempt to rein in ballooning subsidies. Saat ini, pemerintah harus membuat... President Joko Widodo, also known as Jokowi, said the price hike was the government's last option in a difficult situation. Announcing the decision during a televised news conference, he added the budget for subsidies had tripled and will continue to increase. The change will have major implications for households and small businesses. Drivers from ride-hailing apps said the fuel hike could mean their income will become even lower as the country's economy slowly recovers to its pre-pandemic level. Although Indonesia is Southeast Asia's largest economy, it has been hit by rising global oil prices and a depreciating currency. This year already, it has increased its energy subsidies to three times the original 2022 budget. Fuel prices are politically sensitive in Indonesia, as subsidized fuel accounts for more than 80% of state-owned oil giant Pertamina's sales. The last fuel price hike was in 2014, months after Jokowi took office, aiming to free up fiscal space. It sparked protests across the archipelago. The opposition Labour Party has arranged a protest on Tuesday, involving thousands of workers. Police in Canada are on the hunt for two suspects that went on a fatal stabbing spree that caused multiple deaths and injuries. Authorities urge vigilance as the suspects appeared to target people at random. Canadian police hunted for two suspects on Sunday after a stabbing spree at a sparsely populated indigenous community and a nearby village. At least 10 people were killed in what has become one of the deadliest mass killings in modern Canadian history. At least 15 others were wounded. Rhonda Blackmore, commanding officer of the Saskatchewan Royal Canadian Mounted Police, told a news conference there was no known motive yet. At this stage in our investigation, we believe some of the victims have been targeted by the suspect and others have been attacked randomly. The two suspects were named as 31-year-old Damien Sanderson and 30-year-old Miles Sanderson. Let me be clear. We are still looking for the two suspects. We are asking residents across Saskatchewan and our neighboring provinces to be vigilant. The stabbings occurred across 13 locations in the indigenous community of James Smith Cree Nation and the nearby village of Weldon. In a statement, James Smith Cree Nation said elected elders declared a state of emergency and set up two emergency operation centers in response to the situation. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau tweeted that the attacks were horrific and heartbreaking and urged Canadians to follow updates from local authorities. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Chileans are voting to approve or reject a progressive new constitution that would replace its current market-friendly text dating back on the Augusto Pacheco dictatorship. Former U.S. President Barack Obama has won an Emmy. The 61-year-old clinched the award for best narrating, beating the likes of David Attenborough, Lapito Nyang'o, and Karim Abdul-Jabbar. Strong winds and high waves pounded the port on South Korea's Jeju Island as the country raised its typhoon alert level to its highest with the nearing of the typhoon Hinamno. Over 500 emergency personnel were preparing to help with the aftermath of the magnitude 6.8 earthquake which struck China's Zhejiang, the strongest to hit the province since 2013. Tennis great Serena Williams bid her fans an emotional farewell night after losing her third round match in the US Open in what's expected to be her last match as she evolves away from her legendary tennis career. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed watching of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. In recent times, awareness of how climate change can affect the world has been rising. We are leaving you tonight with views of an exhibition featuring artwork made of plastic waste, which seeks to remind a wider audience of its impact in the more accessible way. Stay safe and have a good night. Thank you.